everyone. This is Rob Keynes with the Freedom Report, and this is your weekly market wrap. We're doing it this week on Thursday, June 6, 2024, uh, because I wanted to let some economic data come out that we can talk about today and let some of these stories develop. We'll get into it. And uh, following this, I'll have a series of shorts for the channel. Uh, I have a little bit of housekeeping at the end. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what's going on in the channel and make an announcement about where you may be able to see me at a conference here pretty soon. Uh, there's been a lot of data. The big data next week is really around the Fed's interest rate decision. I believe that's next Wednesday uh, about what they're going to do at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So that will have a big effect on the markets, on the bond market, on the stocks, and on all of the markets, as well as interest rate expectations for the year. That If they decide to do something and not just stand pat, whether they're cutting or easing or whatever the case may be, you know, or raising rates, um, that will definitely set off a firestorm of talk and it will definitely move the markets as we head into summer. Um, we'll see if they stand pat. I think the Fed, um, as a little preview to what we'll talk about next week, I think the Fed is between a rock and a hard place and they're considering their options. Um, they definitely want to make this a uh, positive environment for the economy, especially heading into the presidential election. But I think the data is kind of forcing their hand to be sort of in the middle right now, try to play both ends. And uh, it would be very interesting what they do next week. But let's talk about the economic data we've had over the last week, week and a half. Um, after Memorial Day holiday, we got a uh, case Shiller home price index is still rising 7.4%. So it's rising at a slightly higher clip than it was a previous month, which was 7.3%. What was really interesting last week is the consumers. Consumer confidence had fallen down to a 97.5, and it's back up over 100 now to 100.2. That's pretty bullish for consumers. Not as bullish as it was around the holiday season last year, but consumers are feeling decent, I guess, about what's going on right now, probably because we're heading to the summer season, and it's kind of like a holiday. I mean, people are going on vacation, making plans, and maybe there's a little bit of euphoria there. When actually looking at the economic data, maybe not quite so rosy. Initial jobless claims rose. This month to 219,000, there were 216,000 the month before. GDP fell uh, last month. It was 3.4%, this month 1.3%. So it looks like we're the recessionary trends in the economy are, keep moving forward. Our U.S. Uh, trade balance in goods is negative 99.4 billion. That's up from negative 91.5. It means we're spending a lot more than we're making on our exports. I mean, we're importing a lot more. And it means that manufacturing is basically collapsed. As I've been talking about the last few months, manufacturing indices have been collapsing. And that puts our trade account balance, how much we buy from other countries versus how much they buy from us, in a negative state, which forces us to basically take on more debt as a nation. That's not a good trend at all. Advanced retail inventories, uh, what the retailers are stuffing their shelves with before you go to buy them, that's why they're called advance, is up 0.7%. So retailers are gearing up for a little bit of sales, although I don't know if the consumer is going to be able to meet them and actually buy the goods, but we'll see what happens. Uh, pending home sales, the home sales that are under contract and whether or not they actually reach fruition, people get their loans or pay their cash or whatever, that segment of home sales is absolutely crashing. It was a positive 3.4% last month. This month, it's a negative 7.7%, which means we're having more people back out, either back out of existing contracts or not put the contract in in the first place. Uh, so pending home sales definitely are down. Uh, personal income uh, is lower than it was last month. It rose 0.5% last month, this month 0.3%. Consumer spending has also fallen because personal income has fallen. It was 0.7% up last month. Now it's only 0.2%. And we've had some persistent inflation. The PCE year over year is 2.7%. That's way too low. We know inflation is higher. That government uh, measure is not good, but it is showing increased inflation. And lastly, the Chicago business barometer, good indication of business around that area of the country uh, is down to 35.4. And according to Market Watch, quote, Chicago business activity index weakens to lowest level in four years. That would be since the pandemic. Uh, index drops to 35.4, well below the 40.8 expected by economists. Quote from the article, um, this is a sixth consecutive reading in contraction territory for this index. The index is produced by SM Chicago with MNI. It released to subscribers three minutes before its release. Uh, it's one of the it's one of the last of the regional manufacturing indices before the key national ISM manufacturing survey, uh, which we'll get into. So overall in Chicago, not great things. That was last week's economic data. So far this week, 
as we look at what we've going on, the U.S. manufacturing PMI from the S&P is actually slightly up to 51.3. But again, that's a slight blip. That's a month to month. It's uh, manufacturing overall is still way, way down. Construction spending is down 0.1%. ISM manufacturing, what I just referred to in that Chicago study, is at 48.7. So it's fallen. So the national measure of manufacturing has fallen. Uh, factory orders are about even 0.7% percent up, not even a percent. So overall, not really any growth from factory orders. And of course, we had the ADP employment numbers, which I talked about on Twitter, are down 152,000 off 36,000 from expectations. And initial jobless claims are up to 229,000, which means less people are finding jobs and employers are hiring less, which is a sign that we're in a recession. Um, the big employment report comes tomorrow. That's the non-farm payrolls or what they're now calling the U.S. employment report. That's the government's numbers. That was positive 175,000 last month. Given what's coming out of ADP and the jobless claims, we'll see whether the government's numbers indicate positive movement on employment or negative. I'm guessing probably flatline or slightly negative, but the government has a way of overstating that and then revising it down later. So it wouldn't surprise me if they came out with a positive report and then it got revised down later much more. The U.S. dollar index is down. Um, if I look at a long-term chart, let's say a year-to-date chart, we peaked at about 106. Now we're about 104. If I look at it over the last three years, it peaked at over 110 in 22. Um, now we're at 104. So the dollar is kind of holding steady, but it's a little bit weaker than it's been in recent years. And I think that's kind of a sign of what's going on with de-dollarization, although we haven't seen anything super significant. As I report it, uh, silver is up $1.27 today as we get into the precious metals. In fact, let's go ahead and share a screen on that for the rest of the way. And we'll give you the precious metals report and get into what uh, I see going on there. So you can see on goldprice.org, 3128 silver is up a buck 27. Time of reporting is about 2 p.m. Central time when I'm recording. Uh, and instead of premiering this tonight at 6.30 p.m. Central, I'm going to put it out as soon as I get the video cut. Um, the gold price is up $16 to $23.71. So gold's doing very well. It's not up at its high of like $24.60, what it was. Uh, but silver is, again, above that 40-year trading range, so it's still in positive ter territory when we look back at the 40-year trading range. Now, that's not adjusting for inflation. That is the nominal type line number, not the real number. So you, people would say, well, Rob, it really hadn't broken out because if you adjust for inflation, for silver to break out of 40-year trading range, it may need to be 80, 90 bucks. I would agree with you, but I'm just saying that from a technical perspective, the way chartists look at it is we've had a technical breakout beyond that predominant 40 year trading range. And I'm saying the predominant 40 year trading. I'm not saying that it didn't spike up to 50 in 2011, which it did 49.50. I'm just saying that predominant trading range of silver over the last 40 years has been broken, at least in nominal terms. And we're going to see what that means for silver going forward. Looking at gold on the CME Group's website, uh, we're now down a little bit lower um, a volume, which generally means the price goes up. So you're looking at the price going up. Generally, that's lower volume because when the shorts come in, they come in and concentrated positions all at a time. And so generally, when you see a little bit less activity in the market, it allows the price to kind of creep up a little bit. And when you see these big spikes, it usually not always, but usually means the shorts are coming in because they tend to do it all at once. The, the shorts are very concentrated on this market and they'll put in their position, boom, because they're taking a position to play the prices and they're going to do it all at once. They usually don't ease their way in quite so much. Uh, looking at the volume here, the totals from yesterday we had an increase of 5921 contracts very healthy trade of 450 3000 contracts not quite the 500000 we've been seeing at times the last couple of weeks but still good 437 deliveries which is good because this is a weak month there's only 976 contracts open as you look down here so about half of the or about a third of the open ones were delivered so we're still getting deliveries you know the first few days not bad um the EFP 1652 what is an EFP? It's when you take a COMEX contract in the U.S., a futures contract. You're betting, in other words, on the futures price of gold or silver forward a couple of three months. And you're going over to the OTC market in London and getting access to their pricing. Usually it means COMEX is either priced below that market or uh, there's not enough liquidity in the market to serve those trades. So they go over, over the pond. Block trades at 900. Block trades are when two people directly agree on a trade and then they they agree on it and then they put it in the system all at once it's called a block trade when you see those elevated sometimes that's an indication that uh somebody's coming in in a bulk format saying i either want your you know 
to take a big short or long position and I've got a counterparty there that we've already agreed to. Sometimes it could be hunting potentially for physical deliveries, depending on the position. But I notice that the block trades are kind of up recently. And it's indication that some players on the market are taking hard, big point in time positions on the market to establish their position. As those numbers and the EFPs increase, to me, it's a signal that people are hunting for those price differentials between the U.S. and the rest of the markets and potentially hunting for the physical even though it's not a direct correlation with physical deliveries, it's an indication that people are coming in the market looking for differences in prices or looking for the physical metal. Uh, overall volume on Wednesday, 179,000 closed contracts. Let's go over to settlements. When we look at the Wednesday data, we can see that uh, gold was up about $28 and something on the dominant contract month, which right now is, if you look at this line, the August line, this 376,000 number right here, uh, that's where most of the trading is going down. And then the next big month is going to be December. And you've already seen people start to add contracts. That's the end of the year. So as we work towards the end of the year, a lot of open interest in gold and silver, even heading into the summer. Uh, August is the last summer month. And for it to be so robust right now is a pretty good sign. I think that means we're going to have a fair bit of interest in gold and silver in the summer, maybe counter to what we typically see in the summer, which is usually a you know sell and may go away type of situation. I think that we have more world interest in the market, and I think that we're going to have some robust trade. So it wouldn't surprise me to see gold and silver make some pretty impressive moves both up and down during the summer as the world kind of battles it out on the COMEX. Moving over to silver, volume is pretty frothy in silver. If you look at the trend, you got a pretty frothy silver. Uh, there's a battle at that $30 line yesterday. We're sitting right at 30. I took a screenshot for Twitter. It's sitting literally at 30.00 on the market for silver. And then we're up today, so we have some up days, some down days, but that $30 is the battle line, essentially. And this volume is where the longs and shorts are kind of battling it out on the market to see who's going to win there, at least from you know, a derivative or a price or a paper perspective, not necessarily from physical. Um, we'll look at close 179,000 contracts of 5,000 ounce silver. That's very healthy for the silver market. EFP is 575. That's lower. Well, that's about what we've been seeing in the last few months. Block trade's not heavy in silver like it is in gold. Um, total volume healthy at 70,024. That's Wednesday's data. If we come down to Tuesday, another healthy $179,000 contracts, 120 deliveries. This is not a big delivery month, so you're not going to see a ton of deliveries, but you still see some EFPs elevated 11, 1171, about double normal that you would see in silver. So a lot of interest Tuesday of this week and going over to that London market to see, you know, what silver they can dig up. A few block trades here, 128. Remember, this is 5,000 ounces on silver versus 100 on gold. So even though less block trades, more physical ounces uh, per contract. And so there is a healthy interest in doing these sort of point in time set deals with a, an established counterparty in the market rather than going in the market and kind of playing the market. People are coming in saying, I want the silver position here. Do you agree? Yes, I agree. Okay, let's do these big contract blocks. And that tells me people are trying to pick specific price points in the silver market, just like they are gold. And that also tells me that people are trying to use that to offset some of the price volatility we've been seeing. And that's also an indication that the summer should be pretty active in both the gold and silver markets. As we go over to settlements, um, we can see pretty healthy settlements yesterday. Silver is up about 45 cents uh, on the dominant month. What is the dominant month? Let's go back and look. Uh, I should know this off the top of my head, but it was with 128,000 contracts, the near term, July, that's rotating into September, and then the last one will be December. Um, so we'll see July frothy until we get close to July. Most of those contracts are rolled to September. Then as we get close to September, most of them will roll to December. That's just the way the futures market works. So overall, uh, pretty healthy trade in both gold and silver. And I'm seeing in the EFPs and block trades and in the overall volume, that there is a healthy interest in the markets heading into summer. It could fall off a cliff. I don't think it's going to. I think that people see the presidential election coming up. They see some of the economic data. They see a little bit of, of weakness in the U.S. dollar. They see that trade imbalance with the U.S. They see that the, the Fed has an interest rate decision coming up. And so there is a lot of active positioning in this market. And I think the summer may be a little bit more active, at least the first half of it, than we're used to seeing in gold and silver. And that means our prices could move around quite a bit. We're looking at the CFTC COT report, commitment of traders. This is where you look at the, the four major groups of people. You have the producer merchants here, which are either producing the metal or using it. So that, that's legitimate hedging these columns. These contracts are to, to hedge out or to insure or to offset price risk from people using the physical commodity. 
Swap dealers are the bullion banks or the commercial banks. Sometimes they're hedging physical, but there's enough here really to hedge the market going forward. So swap dealers is more of a speculative category, in my opinion, based on what I've seen in these markets for years and years. Managed money are the financial houses, the funds, that kind of thing. They tend to, to be a little bit more rosy on the long side of the precious metals right now than the bullion banks. So you can see managed money sort of taking the other side of the bullion bank strategy. And the bullion banks often trade against the managed money to make their money on, you know, just making pennies on, on each contract or dollars on each contract. The other reportables, again, just for those of you that don't watch the program all the time, are basically the family offices, um, healthy, small and medium businesses, uh, not big entities, but well enough to do entities that they can take a contract position. Uh, again, this isn't a mom and pop market. You and I don't have the money to get into this unless you're independently wealthy because of the money that you have to put up and the risk that's here. But definitely other reportables are sort of that wealthy class, wealthy small business, medium business sort of group. Anyway, so defining that, um, there was a release of some positions, uh, some shorts, some short covering, if you will, on the swap dealers. Uh, once the prices came down to about 30 and I think at 1.29 something level, uh, the swap, and this is old dated to May 28th because it's always in arrears. So what you saw last week with the weakness in silver price allowed the banks to drop 17, 70, 1785 of their shorts and capture that money with short covering. Uh, and they went long a little bit. I expect, and they're more than two to one short to long, 7696 short, 3267 long. They've got a, a very high concentrated short position in silver. So they're going to have to short cover, which is why I think we're going to see some choppiness in the silver price going forward. They just have too many short contracts not to want to short cover. So they got to bring that price down, short cover some of those contracts, roll them into new months. So I think you'll see for June, uh, a very interesting battleground in silver around that 30, that, well, let's say 28 to 34 dollar mark in silver. Will the long wins, will the short shorts win? The bullion banks definitely need that price to, to fluctuate, to dump some of these short contracts as they go along and maybe roll it off or roll it into a new month. Gold, same thing. Uh, the bullion banks have the highest short position. You can tell down here if you look at percent of open interest held by indicated number of largest traders. The short have the highest concentrations, more than two to one to the longs uh, here and here. Of four less traders, eight less traders. And it's the bullion banks who are the big concentrated short for the most part. There are other entities kind of playing to that, but most parts of bullion banks. We know that from the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which actually tells you who the big concentrated holders are in these derivative markets and it's four big banks, which I've gone over many, many times. So that's how we know. And we combine that information with this report, two government reports. Um, overall, same thing, a lot of short covering and gold by the swap dealers. Uh, also some long covering, those 70, 70, oh, 7,000 long contracts dropped, 8,140 short contracts dropped, a little bit of weakness in gold price allowed that to occur. And they're probably rolling over to new months and that type of thing as well. It's a rollover you know, as we move into the later months of the year and we get into summer, they take their longer term three to four month position. So that's normal. You see a huge drop on both sides of the ledger for the managed money. In gold, they basically just decided we've got too much exposure overall. We're just dropping contracts. So the managed money is doing the typical sell and man go away. They're dropping a lot of long and short contracts, reducing their overall position as we get into summer months. And I think what's going to happen is you look at this general positioning by the bullion banks versus the managed money. The bullion banks are going to, they're dropping too because their primary other side of the trade has been the financial houses. And as the financial houses do the sell and man go away, you're going to see a little bit more weakness in terms of overall uh, interest in the market in gold. You can see right here, this negative 45,000 number right here is, is signifying less interest in gold. So in other words, silver is still frothy for the summer, gold a little bit less so in terms of overall interest. And that might kind of give you an idea of where you see gold and silver going in June and July. Um, they're setting up differently for the first part of summer. Silver a little bit more concentrated interest right now, gold a little bit less. And so I think that more volatility and silver price coming forward in the next month or two than potentially gold. I want to talk about the mining stocks here for a second. Um, here's a GDX chart. You can see we've had a nice uptick this year. It's been up some, but overall it's not where it was in 2020 when you had the government shutdowns and you had a lot of people investing in the physical. So the difference in this market is even though gold has gone up solidly and silver has gone up solidly more so than in 2020 in terms of top line nominal prices, the mining stocks are not reacting. The American consumer is not jumping in. Now, in the GDX, where you got your mids to your majors, this is a healthier market than the GDXJ, the juniors, which I'll show you in a minute. But it's nowhere near where it was in, in 2011 when we had our peak. 
Uh, GDX, I think, was at 6280 was a peak number, I think. And right now it's at 3601. So you're still about 26, 27 points off. You're still 40% off of where GDX was in 2011. So we're not talking about a complete recovery in the mining stocks. We're seeing a little bit of interest, but there's still a downward trend. If we were to draw a line here from the high in the pandemic of 4294 to now, we have a series of lower highs and a series of almost stable lows. And it's setting up in a little bit of a flag pattern. It's not pronounced. The lows are slightly up or the highs are slightly down. But that tells me we've got a ways to go in that consolidation. In other words, we're not seeing the concentrated long interest coming into the mining sector. We've got a little bit of a flag pattern here in the last few years. So while gold and silver have gone up, we're not seeing that reflected in interest for the mining sector just yet. When you look at GDXJ, it gets worse. Where we've been sitting in this horrid trading range dating back to 2013. Of course, we had the 2011 high on that index of 166.60. It's come down to about 2013, 2014, about mid-2013, where it traded in this range. A couple of pops during the pandemic. And during that little boost in 2016, if you remember back 2016, there was a little bo boost in the precious metals. Uh, but we came out of that and it flatlined. Uh, flatlined here. And then we had a boost during the pandemic and then it, the government shutdowns and then it flatlined. The juniors 100% are not responding to the higher gold and silver prices. And personally, I think that that means that the the people are, the, the miners aren't buying into the rally in gold and silver. And I think the big indicator that I, I talked to a lot of mining companies lately, other people that deal with the mining sector have a lot of data, just kind of making the rounds the last week and a half and putting out feelers and talking to people. I also in March went to PDAC, the largest mining conference in the world in Toronto, and talked about 40 different companies and a lot of other analysts as well. I talked to uh, Jeff Clark and some others along the way about what's going on in the sector, a lot of mining companies. And there seems to be somewhat tepid interest in the mining stocks, even though the top line gold and silver prices are up. And I think that has a lot to do with people aren't buying the rally. But what I'm hearing from the mining execs is not a lot of people are buying the shares. And so there may not be a lot of disposable income out there as we look at the weakness in the overall in the U.S. economy and in the Canadian economy. You know, what really will will boost up these mining stocks is the U.S. and Canadian investors. And they're not really coming in right now. I may not have a disposable income to buy the mining stocks. They and they haven't rotated from their normal stock por and bond portfolios into uh, the precious metals equities. So the precious metals equities are not getting bid right now. There's just not a lot of interest, even though the prices are up. That befuddles a lot of people, kind of befuddles me. But I think it's a combination of lack of discretionary monthly budget income to put into these. And people aren't coming off of their stock market investments in the S&P and Dow and rotating over into precious metals just yet. Um, you could also say some money is also going into Bitcoin or crypto complex. I think that's true. But I do think there's enough interest in commodities. Commodities is a huge historic sector that when the next recession comes and when you have people sector rotating out of traditional stock and bond portfolios and some of their real estate holdings, especially REITs when you're buying the paper, not the physical property, I think some of that will roll not only into the cryptos, but I think it'll roll back into gold and silver physical. And I think it'll roll back into the equity. So I think we're going to have a nice boost to equity some point in time this year as the recessionary indicators get stronger. And as we head toward the presidential campaign and we get a little bit of that political, um, uh, uh, what do I want to call it? The the We don't know what's going to happen on the political scene. So a little bit of, um, I don't want to say uncomfortable, but uh, lack of clarity until we actually have the presidential election. I think that may drive some interest into the mining stocks, but they're certainly not buying the rally right now. And it has a lot to do with discretionary income in the consumer and people not sector rotating other stuff because stocks are still high right now. And even though bond interest rates are high, there's still enough interest in that that their bonds haven't collapsed. And even though real estate is starting to get to that peak and starting to roll over in some of the data, it hasn't happened to the point where people are panic selling out of either their physical properties or their REITs and getting into the mining stocks. So I think we'll get there eventually. We're just not quite there yet. All right. On to announcements and uh, business. I'm going to be uh, at Portfest. I'll be there the second half of the week, uh, Friday, Saturday, for sure, at Portfest. Uh, here in New Hampshire. If you want information, just go to porkfest.com, P-O-R-C, Fest. It is basically sort of a libertarian or freedom-oriented um, uh, conference. It's kind of out in the woods. It's not in the building. It's out in the woods. We're going to have, we're sharing a big tent 
and we will be there doing an all day YouTube with on one of the days. I'll be on stage a couple of times during the event. I'm actually going to be on stage representing Citizens for Sound Money along with the executive director, Daniel Diaz, right before Ron Paul speaks, which will be awesome. I'm kind of hoping to meet Ron Paul here for the first time in person if I get lucky enough to do it. Uh, but we'll be speaking before him. I'll also have a solo one hour presentation there. So if you're interested uh, to the festival, go here, get tickets. If you're in New Hampshire or anywhere near Hampshire and you have time to do it, that's coming up here in about two weeks ish from today when I'll be there, Thursday, Friday, Saturday time frame. So if you're interested in coming out and seeing us, if you're in the area and you're just interested in a liberty minded conference, whether you're red or blue team, an anarchist, a libertarian, an independent, whatever your political affiliation, if you just believe in freedom concepts and principles, uh, the Porcupine Freedom Festival is a big one every year. New Hampshire has a history of having this type of political activity. Uh, well, not political, cultural activity around freedom. I should put it that way. And you're certainly welcome. So certainly come out. And, and this will be my first time going. I heard it's going to be just wonderful, a lot of fun. We're going to have a youtube -a We're going to have a place where we can, a little sort of market, if you will. I think on the day of, uh, I think it's Saturday morning, we're going to have some sort of food or something at the main stage. Uh, a lot going on there. So if you're interested, please join us. We would love to have you. I'm going to be so excited to speak. This is the type of conference I've always wanted to do and finally able to get over there to do it. Last bit of news for those that stayed to the end. Uh, a lot of you have noticed that I've reduced the amount of content on the channel since we've renamed it the Freedom Report. A couple of reasons for that. We're trying to reorganize and get some new speakers on the channel. But also, um, I've had a bit of a burnout. I've been doing this for almost five years and writing for almost 15. And so I need to take a bit of a break. And I think heading into summer where it's going to slow down just a bit, it's a good time for me to kind of rejuvenate, you know, take some time, a little bit of time away from social media, concentrate on some other things while still keeping a prize. So every week we are going to do the weekly market report. That's my promise. That keeps me sharp about what's going on. That gives you information about what's going on. I can spin off segments of this video onto Twitter in short form, kind of keep you guys interested and informed for those that follow me. I'm also going to do probably instead of a second video every week, a series of short videos, like right after this, I'm going to do some shorts for the channels, but I'm going to reduce content just a bit, just because we're getting into a little bit of the soft season typically. Now, if breaking news comes out, I'll still be, you know, Johnny on the spot with that and, and talk about that with you on social media. I'm certainly not leaving, just giving myself some time to rejuvenate, do some other things like Pork Fest and some other more concentrated conference type activities and some behind the scenes stuff we're doing with Citizens for Sound Money as far as legislation and fundraising. I'm getting more involved kind of behind the scenes on some things. Still be here. Freedom Report's going to grow. We're going to continue to be here. But I'm kind of shifting this summer to doing some behind the scenes stuff. Still be here in front of the camera for you guys, but I may reduce content just a tad. Just wanted to explain that for anybody so you don't worry about I'm leaving. I'm not leaving. Uh, I'm just rotating some other activities. But certainly we'll definitely have weekly videos, some shorts. We'll definitely be on Twitter. Um, uh, we'll send an occasional email. I don't spam people. Last email I sent was like a month ago. We don't spam people, but get on the email list. We do send information out there. For those of you that are still interested in precious metals, I don't have the store anymore, but I do do private sales based on appointment. So if you're interested, I have a lot of people that come to me in, in that format. Um, I, I had one buy me lunch earlier this week and we had a good chat and I have other people that want me to send stuff across the country. So if you're interested in precious metals deals, just reach out to info at gold silver pros. We're going to change that email eventually, but info at gold silver uh, We'll change it as we change the channel name. And definitely we can assist you with that or just get on our mailing list and um, we will, you know, get that that email out to you and, and help you out with that. We we'll just go into a little bit of a different format here because press mail sales are weak in the United States right now. So uh, it just makes sense to do it that way. I can still serve the people that want to be served. Uh, and that's about it. That's all of the business for the channel today. Thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm trying to keep these shorter under 30 minutes. I got this one right at 29. So we're going to jump off. Thank you so much for joining the channel. Thank you for being a supporter all these years of my work, whether it be the written or the video or conference or even, you know, in person. I thank everybody that's contributed, all the people like Tim and uh, all these other people that and Chris that send me tons of research that I use on the show. I uh, love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting and stay tuned to the channel. We've got more coming up. Until next time, Rob Kinks, The Freedom Report. Mm -hmm.